It's time for another round of your favorite Mets stories told by your favorite Mets. I'm your host, Mike Janella, and with me today is a guy who had one of the most iconic, one of the most significant catches in Mets history, preserving the only no-hitter in Mets history. Now he's coaching some of the best college baseball talent in the world down at Vanderbilt Whitestone's very own Mike Baxter. Mike, how are you, man? I'm doing great, Mike. I'm doing great. How about you? Better now talking to you because uh, you've had – I mean, such a, a cool journey from growing up in Queens to playing for the Mets. That was a childhood dream I had that I never got to experience, but you did. And you got to be part of that, the Johan Santana no-hitter. We're going to talk about all that, but how's life for you? I see you got the, the van, you got the office, the setup. How's coaching life? What's it like for you down in Nashville these days? That's been great. Uh, really, really lucky, really fortunate. Um, the transition from playing into uh, the next career after baseball was was great, uh, almost seamless in a way. Um, you know, for the majority of my career, I was kind of spending the off seasons in Nashville anyway, training here at Vanderbilt, and uh, got this opportunity to join the staff full time in 2017, and uh, it, it's been great. You know, we've got a bunch of good kids that are fun to work with every day, and um, you know, obviously a program that's um, been established over the past 15, 20 years, and uh, it's a great place to come to every day. Getting some publicity lately, because, I mean, you guys might have the top two picks in the draft next year, uh, both pitchers with Kumar Rocker and Jack Leiter, a name, you know, some Mets fans might be familiar with, Al's kid. Uh, you're the hitting coach, but you also, you're a recruiting coordinator. So what was your involvement like getting that kind of talent to Vandy? And what's it like seeing these kids progress? I mean, that's got to be pretty cool. Yeah, so Kumar and Jack, um, in college recruiting, bit earlier um, than most people realize it kind of happens on that front side of high school for some of the players like that so Jack um, was recruited actually right when I got this job so his recruitment was kind of winding down when I took over and, and Scott Brown and um, DJ Sibilic and Travis Stewart they all were coaches here Scott Brown's our pitching coach now but uh, DJ and, and Travis were coaches here the recruiting coordinators before I came so they had their hand in all of those recruiting processes with those two specifically, but as far as watching players come in and, and develop inside of the program, um, seeing them at a young age and then watching them come here, it, it's very fulfilling. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun to watch and um, you, you start to see these kind of personality fibers emerge from these kids and, you know, Jack specifically and Kumar, both those kids are really, really competitive and obviously very skilled, but um, they have great competitive minds uh, that I think play well uh, at the highest levels. Well, it's got to be pretty rewarding for you. and Because you, you're not that far removed from your own big league career. Is it something that these kids looking up to you, does that add to sort of your coaching toolbox that, hey, I kind of did this a little bit recently. I, I've been where you guys want to go. How much does that help you with what you're doing now? You know, um, maybe occasionally, but our, our, this generation of players, they're looking at Pete Alonso, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's all dingers, baby. Yeah, they're on, you know, they're on TV and I get that. And I think that's important to identify, you know, is that we got to stay fluid with the communication and um, the way that we interact with these kids. And, and then, you know, occasionally maybe try to share that language of really what happens inside a big league clubhouse. And, you know, I, I didn't have a particularly um, high level uh, of success in the major leagues. I was able to stick around for a little while, but what I did have access to was some of the best players in the world. And that's really what I try to portray to these, these athletes here is um, tell the stories of some of the best, you know, David Wright, guys like that, um, who had such high level success. And I think when you start comparing those players, you realize how different everybody, everybody thinks and how um, kind of customized their mindset is. And, but they all have this uh, high level of success. And I, I think for a young player, that's important to understand because there's so many different routes to, to um, have a great career, but really, you, you really do have to own your own process and, and you really have to be um, confident in what you do and, and not just trying to, you know, be somebody else. You mentioned the captain by name, David Wright. So since you brought him up, what is something that, you know, you take from him, us as fans or as viewers, we, we see what we see from a guy like him, but what's something you saw from a David Wright, for example, in the clubhouse, on the field, in the dugout, that maybe we don't see that you now want to pass on to a next generation? Yeah, well, I think what the public sees of David um, was his best trait, you know, his desire to win, um, his competitive drive. And like I mentioned earlier with Kumar and Jack, I, I think both of those guys have that fiber. And um, a lot of times that gets taken for granted in athletics, you know, you assume everybody wants to go there, but um, sometimes you get in your own way and you kind of put yourself first. And 
David was, um, you know, he stood out that way. He stood out that way in terms of um, prioritizing the team, um, playing to win. Obviously, you know, the injuries kind of stacked up towards the end of his career, which was so unfortunate because, uh, you know, he was such a cornerstone of that franchise. And, and really, it's exactly what you want to build. Um, you know, and he was such a good role model that way. And then from a physical standpoint, you know, when I speak to hitters, Dave is my example of a guy who, who never got in the weeds of mechanics and technique. You know, um, what made him right was rhythm and timing, you know, and he's an example for me when I talk to a player who um, wants to be very technical and sometimes gets in his own way inside of a game. You know, David's a player that I would reference of, um, you know, th this is a high level hitter where you study his swing on the outside as a, as a person at home and you might come up to some conclusions, but when you talk to him about hitting, um, he wouldn't think in those in that language, you know, he wouldn't think about his hands or anything. He wanted to feel a, a great timing and, and a great rhythm and, and just sync up with the pitcher, you know, so he's a good example of somebody who's very external um, and more feel based as opposed to somebody who's kind of a swing technician. See ball, hit ball. It's worked for hundreds of years almost, or, you know, for that many generations. And if it worked for David Wright, it could work for somebody coming up too. Um, Mike, I want to talk about the catch. Uh, you've talked about it, I'm sure a thousand times, uh, but Indulge me. Are, are you cool bringing back that, that memory? I know a little bit painful, but also a huge part of Mets history. No, always. Yeah, it, it's, uh, yeah it, it's a funny memory because, like you said, I think there was, there was some injury associated with it, but it was uh, still a great night. And I think the further away you get from it, um, you just look at it fondly. You know? so, so let's set the stage again. I'm sure anybody watching this remembers it like it was yesterday, but I mean, 2012, Johan on the mound. Mets have never had a no-hitter in their history. We all knew that. It's the seventh inning. So you're starting to think, okay, this has a shot at being real, at happening. Yadi Molina comes up, one out, and he hits a rope, man. Like, I – off the bat, I think Ron Darling, I don't know the last time that you watched the back that replay, but Ron Darling on the telecast was like, I don't, didn't think there was any way Mike was going to make that catch. But you made it, and, you, you know, you crashed into the wall, and you end up going on the DL for that, but it preserves the no-hitter, which Johan went on to, to ice. What's going through your head in that play? Like I said, I'm sure you've told the story a thousand times, but from the crack of the bat to when that ball ends up in your glove, what's going through your head? Um, well, that seventh inning, that's kind of the sweet spot in a no-hitter. It's like when you start to identify that there's a chance, but it's not like the ninth where you only need three outs, and it's like, hyper you know pressure right where you're like yeah oh. yeah then everybody's biting the nail if i don't yeah, know you're, right. you're kind of in that sweet spot where it's like okay you know you can feel the energy of the stadium you can feel the energy of the game um but you still got a long way to go you know you still gotta get nine outs um, anyway but when yadi hit that ball i think um off the bat in the outfield there are balls that are you know you know you can't catch and obviously there are balls that you know um, you know, a routine. And obviously, I think with Yachty's ball specifically, that's off the bat, that's a ball that I felt like you got to go for. You know, you can make a good, you, you can make a play on and, and you, you got to go get it. And, you know, really, I think it just broke down at the end. Um, you know, uh, I just kind of couldn't get my feet under me. Um, and I kind of, I just couldn't brace for the fence the way you normally would. I think that play happens a lot, honestly. I think guys make plays like that and, and they just are able to kind of brace for the fence and it just is like great play. You know, um, I think the drama to this play was that uh, I couldn't gather myself and uh, slow down enough. And obviously there was, a, you know, an injury component to it at the end um, from just being able, not being able to brace for the impact of the fence. Yeah, drama, I think, is a great word for it because you kind of had that, that – it's very Shakespearean, right? You kind of went out on your shield, you know, sacrificing your own health for a moment in team history and for another guy. I mean, you watch Johan's reaction. First, he's pumped when you make the grab, and then he sees you go down, and just that grimace on his face, he's like, almost like you can hear him thinking, man, I can't believe, you know, he laid his, himself on the line for me like that. Were you thinking at all about the, the fence coming up and, hey, even if this means I get hurt or I take a knock – I've got to make this play or is it just instinct of, Hey, I'm, I'm going after this. Or did you think that you had it all under control? And then just at the end, maybe your footing gave out a little bit. What was the, the sort of calculus of your safety versus making the play? Yeah. I think, you know, when you put that one moment in a 12 year career, you, you have a lot of plays, right. And, and there really isn't much calculus when you're playing, you're just going after the ball. Yeah. And you have those instincts of, all right, how do I play this the proper way? You know, do I have to play off the fence? Do I have to make a play? And, and, you know, obviously, I think when you get into a, 
a setting like that where there is a no hitter, obviously you're a little bit more charged up to try to make a play. You want to try to preserve it. Um, you want to try to make sure you give the best opportunity to make the play. So, you know, um, going after it, uh, I don't think you're actively weighing, okay, am I going to get hurt? Am I not going to get hurt? I think you feel like I can catch the ball. Um, and that's really what I was thinking on that play. I'm just going to make this play. Um, and I'm going to catch the ball. And I think whenever you get close to the fence in the outfield, you know, it's coming. Um, and unfortunately this time, I just, I just couldn't brace for it. Did Johan get you anything like a pick up a dinner tab or like a watch or something to say thank you afterward? What was that interaction like? It, it, you know, the funny thing about that is just, I got hurt. He pitched a couple of times. He got hurt. So when I came back, he was gone, you know, he was hurt. So we were kind of on, on different schedules of rehab um, because right when I started getting healthy, I think is when he kind of got dinged up again. And, you know, we, I don't know if we ever played a game again together or not, you know, that'd be interesting to go back and look. I'm not yeah, sure. I have to look that up. Yeah. You know, Cause um, the next year I was kind of up and down and I was washing out, you know, and I know he dealt with some injuries too. So um, we, we never really got back to that kind of um, dynamic that we had prior and not because of, anything personal it was just I think situationally we were just kind of on different rounds yeah out of your control did, he, did you guys talk that night at all or were you just dealing with the shoulder or did he get a chance to chat with you after the game or after the inning anything like that he came back right after the inning um you know and he was I think he was up second the next inning or maybe leading off I'm not sure it might have been second um but you know you've been down in the clubhouse the, the training room is pretty far away from the dugout uh, it's all the way down the right field line so he came back in. I was in the training room getting checked out with the doctors. And Johan ran back to check on me um, to see how it was wow. going. He was like, great catch, great catch. Thank you, great <laughs> catch. And then you could tell, you know, he ran back outside. And um, watching the game back, he actually is delayed in getting onto the on-deck circle. And I think that's a story not many people know. Um, and I think the general consensus or ideas that Terry was trying to figure out, does he stay in, does he stay, you know, trying to make that decision. And I don't think it was necessarily the decision. It was more that Johan was in the training room, um, you know, checking on me. And then he popped out on deck. Um, and obviously the, the crowd erupts, right? Because he's at 125 pitches, no hitter. Um, everybody wants to see him go. But again, very Metzian, another layer of drama, you know, where <laughs> I'm out on deck on time and everybody who does, it's like, all right, you know, we're going to, they're going to move forward with this. He's going to get a shot to finish it out. Wow. Yeah. I never knew that, that, you know, he was late. I was thinking the same thing you were. Are they keeping him in? Are they going to, going to take him out because of the pitch count? I never knew he was back saying thanks to you and checking on you. That's a really cool story. That's gotta be a, a great memory. You keep all these years later. Yeah. That, that's what sport is, you know? And I think like a lot of, um, a lot of people always ask, you know, what, what happened next? You know, what well, it's not about that stuff. I mean, it's just in that moment you have, an incredible competitor on the mound who doesn't even have his best stuff that night. You know, when you really look at that, you think about all the games that guy pitched, yeah. he wasn't close to his best night, but he competed at such a high level. Um, and I think he could feel it and he knew what was on the line. And, and, you know, everybody after the fact looks back and they think about the decision from Terry and, you know, Terry, I know Terry put himself through hell for a while about that too, you know, like, but Johan was supposed to be there that night. You know, that, that was his, that was one of many great nights in his career, but that, that was, there was a level of fate to that, you know, um, but you can always tell he was such a great teammate, um, you know, and that's so in line, just the fact that he would run back in and check on me um, to see how I was. It's very in line with who he was and who he is as a person, but definitely who he was as a teammate. That's, that's really cool to hear. And it's part of, that's what I, you know, when guys are out of the game and they say, oh, I miss the camaraderie, that's what I miss the most, being with the guys in the clubhouse on the team. It's stories like that that I would think is, is the kind of stuff that really makes being a pro all it's cracked up to be, you know? Yeah, and that is. I think when guys talk about missing the clubhouse, and, the, the, you know, that's not standard, though. I think that's important. You know, we're talking about some really great teammates. We're talking about David Wright. We're talking about Johan Santana, right? Um, those guys, they led with those things, you know, and I think um, it's important that they're recognized because that's not normal. You know, there's a lot of people that are fine, you know, but they don't necessarily um, lead with such um, kind of empathy and, and also awareness and kind of team first mentality. And, and both those guys, to me, they were, uh, they were very special leaders. 
Well, to put a bow on the talk about the catch, I just wish that we had stack cast like we had now back then to see kind of the catch probability and the route that you took and all that stuff. I think that would be cool. But besides that, it's still an awesome memory. So thanks for giving it to, you know, Mets fans all over the place. It's something I don't think any of us will ever forget. Did you keep anything from that? Do you have the glove from that game or like a piece of the wall or, or the ball you caught or any souvenir? Uh, I, I have the glove. It's in my glove. Okay, nice. I, I use it to play catch with my kid. My <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's awesome. Yeah, so I have it. You know, I, I've never had a big collection of memorabilia. Um, I never really, uh, I, I never really did that. But um, I have the memories from that night, obviously, um, you know, and that, that experience. And um, I'm grateful just that, uh, you know, I, I've, I have a little chapter of Mets history, you know, and I played a part in a, in a great night of Mets history. Um, I'm always grateful for that. that that's, that's pretty cool. And it was almost baked into your blood just by proximity. Because I want to talk about, you know, you growing up. It's a long history of Mets players that were from New York City, even Lee Mazzilli, John Franco, even back to Ed Cranepool, right? But to be from Queens and to make it to play for the Mets, uh, much rarer. And you grew up in Whitestone, Bayside Little League, right? Yeah. So was that always kind of the dream? Hey, I want to play in Flushing? Or did that just become something you thought about maybe when you got older and it became more realistic? Or when was that part of your head as a kid? No, that was five years old. You know, that was nice, anything, nice. You know, swinging a bat or, you know, doing anything. It was Howard Johnson and Daryl Strawberry and, you know, those who I pretended to be those guys in my front yard, you know. Um, and then taking the seven train to high school and, you know, going by the field every day um, and seeing that winning a city championship in 2002 at Shea stadium, you know, um, these little pockets of time where uh, I think when you reflect on a career, you, you realize how interweaved the Mets were in your life. Um, and then you, you get the, you get the pleasure to reflect now and, and not necessarily have to compete for it daily. And I think when you're doing it, um, you, you have to be present. You can't just get caught up in that emotion, you know, um, of, wow, this is amazing. And, you know, uh, you, you're a little bit in more of a competitive space with that, you know, but I think the, one of the, the best parts of not playing um, is just being able to look back with clarity and, and realize how fortunate and um, lucky you know, I was to be given those opportunities um, to come out and play for the Mets. And, um, you know, sometimes, like I said, you just work in sports and to, to be able to do things in, you know, places that you call home, you know, like Queens, um, share that experience with your family. It's so rare, you know, uh, it's just so rare to have that because generally, you know, athletes just go wherever the games are. Um, but to be able to spend two or three years there, and really reflect at a, at a career and, and look back at that pocket of time, I think as my favorite pocket of time, um, you know, it's very special and I'm very grateful for that. You even, and I forgot about this until I was prepping to talk to you today, you got a proclamation from the city of New York and a citation for being a hometown hero after you made, uh, made the catch to preserve the no-hitter. I mean, I saw the, the ceremony, the councilman came out, gave you the big plaque and everything. Do you still have that? Is that hanging anywhere or do you keep that tucked away? Yeah, my dad is um, the coordinator of all memorabilia. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, he, I'm sure he has everything, you know, in the room uh, in Queens, in the house. I know he does. I know he has all the jerseys and things. So um, a lot of that stuff is back in Queens. That's great. Do you make it back up to Queens at all? And obviously you're very committed now to your job and you're settled down in Nashville, but do you ever get to make it back up this way? Yeah. Yeah. We come back for the holidays. Um, you know, I try to get up there at least once a winter, whether it's for Thanksgiving or Christmas. And, um, you know, if I could shoot up there in the summer for recruiting or, you know, something brings me there, I try to do it. But, um, you know, my parents and my sister, they've uh, enjoyed coming down to visit us as well to get out of the city um, and see it. And obviously, you know, COVID is impacting a lot of that, which is very frustrating. You know, I haven't been home um, yeah. since last year, really. So um, that's frustrating, uh, obviously, but we all got to continue to work through that together. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to getting back up. It's been a while. Well, hey, under safe circumstances, you're welcome back anytime. Uh, well, Mike, uh, that leads me then to what I want to wrap up with you with. And I like to end these chats with, you know, some quick hitter questions. And you still have the Mets record for most walks in a single game. You walked five times in a nine inning game, which by the way, that, that game, are you frustrated that you can't get a knock or are you cool getting on base five straight times? What's, what's a major league think, uh, hitter think about a game like that? 
I don't know what a real major league hitter. I don't know. Like, what, <laughs> <laughs> I said, I love the big league thing. I was not, you know, because uh, I was just to me. I, I I always prioritized, you know, my game. I couldn't hit a ton of home runs, so I was like, I better get on base. You got to do one or the other. You know, you either better get on base. Or you got to hit a lot of home runs, and then you know the best do both, right? A guy like Trout, they can do everything. Um, but for me, I kind of knew my niche, and um, yeah, that to me that was a great game. Bud Black was probably going nuts, you know. In the other, <laughs> I played for Buddy in San Diego. He was my first man. I can't only imagine the thoughts going on in his head, you know, when uh, I walked five times, and uh, I can't imagine he's probably going nuts. Yeah, just wearing out that path of the first baseline. But in honor of those five walks, I'm going to ask you five quick questions about kind of, you know, growing up in Queens, but now you've moved on and see, you know, a little bit about, about your feel for home. So you mentioned earlier you used to take the seven trains to some games in high school. First question, when you were playing for the Mets, did you ever ride the subway to actual Mets games? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I did in, uh, in 11. Yeah, I would take uh, I would take the train in because I got moved up. I, I didn't have a car, you know, and it's crazy. Sometimes my mom would drop me off. Right. And ride, right? Um, you know, she would take me in. Um, and if not, I could take the, uh, the Q14 to Flushing and, and, you know, take the seven train. So, yeah, I did occasionally. And my wife yeah. would take me all the time from Long Island City when I was living there, you know, in 12 and 13. Um, you know, my family would take the train there all the time. That's great. Moms are the best, man. They drop you off when you're seven years old at the game and pick you up. They'll drop you off when you're 27 and in the bigs. It's, they're That's the right. best. They're always looking out. Yeah. So similar question for the next one. When you were up uh, here in the show with the Mets, did you ever actually stay at your parents' house? Were you commuting from there or did you have your own place? In 11, I did. Yeah. Um, just because I got up in August. And obviously at the end of the season, um, you know, uh, you just get where you can get, you know. So rather sit in the hotel for the first week. Um, and then uh, after that, I kind of would stay at my parents' house um, and, uh, and, and go back and forth from there. And then in 12, when I broke, I made the team on opening day. Uh, we got an apartment in 12 and 13. Okay, a little more independence, a little more uh, luxury for yourself. And I'm sure coming home after a night game, you know, on a Wednesday night, coming back home, parents staying up late, that's got to be uh, a tough for all parties involved, I would imagine. <laughs> well, they thought they got rid of me. and then uh... <laughs> Not that easy. Um, third question for you. What do you miss the most about living in Queens? What's something from up here that you just can't get or can't replicate down in Tennessee? The food, you know, just yeah. the food, all hours. You want something at 10, 30 or 11, um, you can get really great food at any time. Um, so I would tell you that um, uh, that's by far the, the number one thing for me. Do you have any favorites, any local recommendations? If people are in the area, they can go hit up, you know, Mike's favorite, favorite food spots. Um, there was a, when I was playing, we go to this place, Sanford's on Astoria, in Astoria. Um, yeah. It, it was, it was great great wings. Yeah. Yeah, good spot, right? So uh, my buddy owned it, and, um, you know, we would go in there all the time. They actually stay open all night unless they've changed. But uh, it was like kind of a 24-hour place, so a great spot after a game to go to, great food. Um, you know, that was one of my local spots. Um, you know, me and my dad and my buddy Keith, we'd go to, you know, once a year we'd go to Peter Luger's, you know, they have mm -hmm. great steaks, obviously. Um, you know, so that was just more of a special thing. But, um, yeah, the, it's just – the feel of New York is uh, so unique, you know, um, that, that is something else. Obviously I'm talking about food a lot, but uh, the feel Fine with of, me, right? Yeah. The feel of the city is, uh, is cool, man. All those little kind of spots, you know, the neighborhood spots. All right. So I have to ask the flip side of the question. What's something that you don't miss about being here? I'm sure like traffic's gotta be a lot better down in Nashville, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't, <laughs> <laughs> like five miles from campus here and it takes me 15 minutes you know i, I live uh, in manhattan in queens and it takes 45 minutes so uh yeah I, I don't i don't particularly miss that i think being able to kind of get around town is uh is much simpler um outside of new york yeah five 15 minutes or less to go five miles sounds like a dream uh let me tell you uh last one for you mike when you do make it back what's the first place you go what's the first thing you do what to you just screams home that when you hopefully make it back again soon this neck of the woods it's the first thing you got to check off the list i mean it's literally going home <laughs> <You> know, it's <laughs> easy enough 
Yeah, it is. You know, I think when I come back, um, it, you know, I don't have a long list of things that I want to do. It's just, um, you know, I want to see, I want to see people, you know, I want to see my family. Um, and I have a few close friends that are still in the city. Um, and, and you just want to make sure you maximize that. So we, we really don't do a ton. Now, as our kids are getting older, we're starting to kind of make sure we take them into the, into Manhattan, maybe do some shows and, and things like that. I think, you know, from a, a entertainment side, we want to make sure they have access to that, to see some, see some things that are kind of unique to New York. Um, but like I said, I, I get picked up or I get home from LaGuardia. I'm going to go to the house and uh, make sure we take advantage of that time. That's awesome. Well, hopefully we get to see you in person at City Field sometime again soon. And I can thank you in person on behalf of all Mets fans uh, for the catch and for, uh, for your time here, you know, making Queens proud on the map. We appreciate it. I appreciate that, Mike. Thanks a lot. All right. My pleasure. Well, good luck to your guys in the draft. And hopefully, you know, next season comes around, we get a bit more of a normal schedule for you. And uh, yeah, go Commodores. Best of luck to you moving forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. For Mike Baxter, my name is Mike Janella. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.